Did you too, O oh friend, suppose democracy was only for elections, for politics, and for a party name? I say democracy is only of use there that it may pass on and come to its flower and fruit in manners, in the highest forms of interaction between people and their beliefs, in religion, literature, colleges and schools, democracy in all public and private life. That was Walt Whitman, Democratic Vistas, published in 1870, 1871. Um, we're celebrating 70 years of the Karl Schurz House today with you. I'd like to introduce Professor Dr. Kai Zina. He um, has the Lichtenberg Professur für Neuere Deutsche Literaturwissenschaft und Komparatistik at the University in uh, Münster with a focus on transatlantic literature. So this is absolutely perfect for us. Uh, he studied in Kiel and Göttingen, is already taught in Göttingen, Jena. Um, he was the Fyodor Linen Fellow der Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung at the University of Chicago. Um, and he has published widely also on Susan Sontag and Thomas Mann, among others. Uh, Dirk Janssen brought my attention to Professor Kaisina while we were exploring this whole idea, and I'd like to um, extend a really warm welcome also to Dirk Janssen, who helped the Karl Schutz House to set up this whole set of ideas for democratic vistas. So we, there's a lot going on today, and I'd like to welcome Professor Kaisina. It's a real pleasure that you're here. I'm, I'm really happy to uh, get to know you and to find out about what you can share with us about Thomas Mann. And if we have time, you can ask a few questions afterwards. Otherwise, we'll use the coffee breaks to interact with our guests. Welcome. All right, thank you very much for the invitation to Freiburg, the kind introduction and the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm grateful, honored, and very much looking forward to our conversation. I could think of no better place for this event on the history and future of democracy than the Karl Schurz House, founded in the wake of American re-education policies, especially at a time when Europe and the United States are once again confronted with authoritarianism, even fascism, and war. The political and social circumstances of our time, they also determine the subject and perspective of my talk today. In Europe, as in the United States, we have long taken democracy for granted. Now it is in a deep crisis, and it is becoming increasingly clear that it needs strong reassurance and possibly also role models in order to prevail. I want to discuss this challenge with reference to Thomas Mann, the world-famous writer, public intellectual, and pub political essayist, posing the following question. To what extent can his democratic thinking and political action be a source of inspiration for us today? Can Thomas Mann even be a mentor for us in questions of democracy? The starting point of my reflections is Mann's speech on the German Republic. And this is another jubilee, <laughs> uh, delivered exactly 100 years ago, in which he renounced the anti-modern, anti-democratic, and not least anti-American thoughts of his book, Reflections of a Non-Political Man from 1918, and explicitly declared his support for the Weimar Republic. Also, in the same speech, we can see that the transatlantic transfer of literature and ideas shaped his matrix of democratic thought early on. Again, this speech is dated 1922, 16 years prior to the American exile. As far as democracy is concerned, Thomas Mann came to the United States not as a stranger, not as an immigrant, not as a refugee. He came home. In the second step, I will take a brief look at the political essays of Mann's American exile, especially at his relationship to President Roosevelt, whom he admired, and in whom he saw the ideal of a democratic leader. Against this background, I will conclude by addressing the question of what significance Mann's understanding of democracy can have for our times. 
Before I get to the details, a brief personal note. I am a West German child of the 1980s and 1990s who grew up in peace and prosperity with a very strong orientation towards American culture as it is probably typical for my generation. I would definitely consider myself a very, very late product of American re-education, which is why it is quite touching for me to give this presentation on the occasion of the anniversary of the Karl Schurz House. Uh, being a product of re American re-education, this is ac uh, actually a quote by Jürgen Habermas, and he said that's in 1970, I think, 1972 or something. But I think for me it's relevant as well. <laughs> Given the premise of my biographical experience, I never would have expect expected that Europe and the so-called West would ever again get into such a dangerous situation as we are in right now. And that, of course, has an impact on how I read Thomas Mann's political statement statements from the 1920s to 1940s. The context has fundamentally changed. I have participated in several public discussions about Mann's understanding of democracy in recent years, mostly in Germany, but also in the United States. Today, however, it feels very different. Thomas Mann and democracy, Thomas Mann as a Democrat, scholars, generally view this constellation skeptically. His statements about democracy are conceptually freehand and theoretically limited, they say. He partly even departs from what can be called democracy in a common sense. As a Democrat, so it is said, Thomas Mann is not completely flawless. And it is true, at least at first glance. Anyone who measures Thomas Mann's democratic convictions against the political criteria of our time will quickly encounter deficits. However, it is doubtful whether such standards of comparison are appropriate at all. The historical context needs to be taken into account properly. Our notions of plurality and diversity were far from obligatory in Mann's days. But more importantly, I want to emphasize that his concept of democracy is not political in a narrow sense. Only secondarily, does he refer to a form of government when he speaks of democracy? What matters to him are the conditions of modern human existence in general. In 1922, Mann gave his much noticed and still controversial, controversial speech on the German Republic, in which he made his first public commitment to democracy. Here you can see the cover uh, of the later book version. The speech is as sober as it is empathetic, a plea for the Weimar Republic, whose central inspirations, among others, is the American national poet Walt Whitman. But what exactly fascinated Thomas Mann about the author of Lees of Grass, this great song of modernity and democracy? The reference can be elaborated by tracing it back to Mann's library, specifically his Whitman edition which he read in 1922, right before he wrote that speech, and which is littered with annotations and marginal notes. In the overall view, they show one thing very clearly. Thomas Mann's interest was directed primarily towards the idea of a plural self, which finds in democracy its correspondent form of society. In the biographical introduction by the translator and editor Hans Reisiger, who was also a friend of Thomas Mann, as you can perhaps guess from this photo. In Reisiger's introduction, which, which precedes the first volume of the edition, Whitman is understood as the spiritual embodiment of the great American motto and promise, et pluribus unum. Thomas Mann etched marked the following passage, which I will first read in German before paraphrasing it in English. Das Bewusstsein der elementaren Fülle und Gegensätzlichkeit in der Tiefe seines Wesens war bis zuletzt in ihm lebendig, jene naturhafte Vieldeutigkeit. Der von dämonischem Wissen um die Vielspältigkeit der Menschenseele zerklüftete, freilich naturhaft wiederum zusammengeschlossene, it's impossible to, to translate that, I think, this is so complicated, so I read it. Okay, I just go on and then I try to paraphrase it. 
der von dämonischem Wissen um die Vielspältigkeit der Menschenseele zerklüftete, freilich nicht naturhaft wiederum zusammengeschlossene, große dänische Denker Kierkegaard schreibt, in einem Leben von 70 Jahren alle möglichen Wesenheiten gehabt zu haben und sein Leben wie ein Musterbuch zu hinterlassen, das man zu gefälliger Auswahl aufschlagen kann, ist nicht so schwierig. Aber die eine Wesenheit, voll und reich, und dabei zugleich die entgegengesetzte zu haben und, indem man der einen Wesenheit das Wort und das Pathos gibt, dahinterlistig die entgegengesetzte unterzuschieben, das ist schwierig. Hinterlist unterzuschieben ist charakteristisch für Kierkegaard. Für Whitman gilt, dass in ihm sich die verschiedenen Wesenhaften, Wesenheiten naturhaft als eines ineinander fügten, mit kindhaft elementarer Selbstverständlichkeit immer in warmer Kraft und Liebe ausströmender Einheit des Seins. In Whitman, according to Reisiger, all sorts of essences fit seamlessly into one, in all their elemental richness and despite their contrariness and ambiguity, quite different from Søren Kierkegaard, the Danish, Danish philosopher for whom the incorporation of the contradictory and ambiguous represents a major challenge to have a unity that is full and rich, and at the same time the opposite, Thomas Mann reads in Kierkegaard, that is difficult. The tolerance of contradictions that Reisiger attributes to Whitman, in sharp contrast to Kierkegaard, finds poetic expression in his work. Do I contradict myself? This is the central question of the song of myself, the heart of leaves of grass, And the singer answers, his, answers it with a serene agreement. Very well then, I contradict myself. The tremendous provocation that such an elastic concept of subjectivity had to represent for Thomas Mann becomes apparent in retrospect of his literary work. The characters of his stories and novels, we need only think of Gustav von Aschenbach in Death in Venice, but also the fierce opponents on the magic mountain, Nafta and Setebrini, are not, and are not able to endure one thing, and that is contradictions in the world and in themselves. Gustav von Aschenbach dies not merely from a strawberry infected with cholera bacteria, but from the inner conflict of artistry and bourgeoisie. The philosophical and political disputes between Nafta and Setebrini, on the other hand, take on increasingly militant traits. And the narrative logic of the novel, their striving for intellectual purity and their inability to form compromises prefigure the primal catastrophe of the 20th century, the First World War, as, quote, a confused noise of battle. As you can see, the elastic concept of subjectivity personally embodied and lyrically impressed, expressed by Whitman is completely at odds with the basic conflicts in Mann's early and partly also in his middle creative period. Thomas, Mann reading, Thomas Mann's reading of Whitman, however, is not limited to the individual plural subject. On the contrary, he also studies what a social form appropriate to this understanding of the subject should look like. A further marginal note, a shorter one, sheds light on this question, this time not in Reisiger's introductions, but in Whitman's Democratic Vistas, the namesake to this very event. Again, I will read the passage first in Reisiger's translation before summarizing it in English. Die Idee des vollkommenen Individualismus ist es in der Tat, die der Idee der Gemeinschaft am tiefsten Charakter und Farbe gibt. Denn wir begünstigen eine starke Vergemeinschaftung oder einen starken Zusammenschluss hauptsächlich oder ausschließlich deshalb, um die Unabhängigkeit des, der Einzelmenschen zu stärken, gleich wie, gleich wie wir auf der Einheit der Union unter allen Umständen bestehen, um den Rechten der Einzelstaaten die vollste Lebensfähigkeit und Freiheit zu sichern, deren jedes genau so wichtig ist wie das Recht der Nation, der Union. The community only has character and color if it permits complete individualism. Whitman draws the ideal of a strong integration that results from the independence of individuals. But what applies to individuals and society, he believes, should also apply to the United States. In reference to Abraham Lincoln, 
He speaks of the unity of the union, which is, however, inconceivable without fullest viability and freedom of the individual states. If one wanted to bring this reflection on the subject society in the United States to a formula, one could fall back on Karl Popper. What Thomas Mann learns in the course of his Whitman reading corresponds, at least in essence, to the idea of an open society that seeks to balance sociality and individuality, totality and particularity. Just how far this, too, is distinguished from Thomas Mann's early, earlier thinking is shown by the comparison with the uh, reflections of a non-political man written during the First World War, which are characteri characterized by an extremely strong demand for synthesis, synthesis and an equally strong anti-democratic attitude. In this political pamphlet, the German character is the middle, the medium, and the mediating and forms therein a contrast to a supposed partiality of other nations and culture. In the reflections, the German even appears as the central human being in the grand style. In his speech on the German Republic, Thomas Mann fundamentally breaks with this nationalist phantasm, which aims at nothing other than an abolition of modern complexity. What would I like to say with these partly philological, partly biographical remarks? Reading Whitman undoubtedly represents an intellectual caesura for Thomas Mann. The coordinates of his, think of his thinking about the subject and society fundamentally change with this reading. Although it is true that Mann had already accepted a certain inner, complex a certain inner complexity and hybridity as a basic condi condition of modern existence before the, before, the world war, before the First World War, before the reflections of an unpolitical man and some other writings intoxicated by nationalism and militarism, what can be seen most impressively in his novel Royal Highness of 1909, that I, that I will discuss briefly later on, an empathetic confirmation of his advocacy of modernity, democracy, and not least America, he finds only in and through Walt Whitman. In a review, he consequently called Reisiger's edition a great, important, sacred gift. It's astonishing, however, that Thomas Mann's speech on the German Republic does not take into account, either implicitly or explicitly, the passages I have just quoted. For instance, Reisiger's praise of elemental richness or Whitman's celebration of complete individualism. Instead, this speech states that Whitman basically repeated the ideas of the romantic poet Friedrich von Hardenberg, who lived from 1772 to 1801 and gave himself the name Novalis. Whitman speaks like Novalis, Mann writes, while Noval Novalis, for his part, is very close to the American. This assertion has also a philological equivalent. Novalis Thomas Mann wrote at the edge of his copy of Democratic Vista. Vistas. In terms of literary history, the assertion of a close uh, relationship between these two authors is quite reckless. But I will not discuss this any further today. What seems more important to me is, is its historical plausibility. In the Weimar Republic, America was a battle cry with which above all conservative circles connected everything that was to be rejected in modernity from urbanization to capitalism to democracy. Thomas Mann himself spoke of the Americanization of the German lifestyle in his reflections of a non-political man, which shows itself in a certain clumsy corruption in profiteering and enterprising ventures of a characteristically naive tone. Undoubtedly, an anti-Semitic subtext also resonates in this statement. In contrast, a new and more benevolent view of the United States manifests itself in the speech on the German Republic. Now, Thomas Mann speaks of democratic pluralism, which has an American freshness to it. So why the recourse to Novalis and German Romanticism at all? <laughs> 
Perhaps it's an, it is an attempt to convey the concept of American democracy to the conservative audience to whom this speech is addressed through the detour of a familiar national culture. Look, in essence, German romanticism and America democracy are much closer than you think. Seen in this light, it is a rhetorical maneuver with which the speaker veils how far he had actually progressed on his intellectual and political way to the West in 1922. Let me jump ahead 10, 20 years from the 1920s to the time of German fascism, the war, and Mann's American exile. The fact that Thomas Mann was a great admirer of the 32nd president of the United States, that he laid all his political hopes on Roosevelt as Hitler's opponent, that with the fourth part of his Joseph novel, he set a literary monument to him and, despite all this, overlooked Roosevelt's negative sides, both personal and political. He really idealized him. The research on all of these pro propositions has already been conducted by Mann's numerous biographers. Rarely, however, have they asked about the linguistic details and semantic nuances in Mann's comments about his president. Of particular significance in this context is his touching obituary for Roosevelt, delivered on April 19, uh, 1945. It culminates in an evocation of a man who had, quote, an appearance of perfect aesthetic charm. What does Mann mean by that? He seems to write about the recently deceased as if he were a character in a novel or a story. And this becomes particularly evident in the passage in which Mann mentions the president's physical ailments, his suffering, which resulted from a polio infection. At the age of 39, Roosevelt had fallen ill. In press photos, he was mostly shown sitting because he had to wear leg braces as a result of his disease. He could only stand upright without pain. He could only stand upright without pain and was usually dependent on a wheelchair. Deeply moved by Roosevelt's suffering and strength, Mann writes, a man and a hero. Our hearts would have beaten for him with less veneration if the heroic, the defiance of fate, the surmounting of weakness that we call courage had not been part of his makeup. The disease that had not been able to kill him and nevertheless lamed, lamed him. His physical impediment brought a pathetic, a touching element into the splendor in his life. And now follows one of the most touching sentences Thomas Mann, for me, has ever written. He could not walk, but he walked. He could not stand, but he stood. <clears throat> in his major study on Thomas Mann's American years, the scholar Hans Rudolf Vagé has shown how strongly this psychology psychologizing image of Roosevelt is oriented around the characters in Mann's literary work. As in the case of Gustav von Aschenbach in Death in Venice, it also applies to the American president that almost everything great that exists, exists as a despite, that is, comes into being despite grief and agony, poverty, abandonment, physical weakness, vice, passion, and a thousand hindrances. For Thomas Mann, Vagé claims Roosevelt is a modern saint, a Sebastian character, like Aschenbach, who grits its teeth together in proud shame and stands there quietly while swords and spears pass through his body. There's only one objection to this charming interpretation. Gustav von Aschenbach fails because of the contradictions in his life. Even more, he is miserably, miserably ruined by them. In contrast, Roosevelt's life and work are, in Mann's view, nothing less than a triumph. He tolerates, endures, even conquers the contradictions of his existence. But this outstanding ability can also be interpreted in a different, more American way. I'm sorry. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. Applied to Thomas Mann's Roosevelt, this phrase sounds much less calm. Indeed, it seems more like a credo of perseverance. And yet the coincidence is unmistakable. From Mann's perspective, Roosevelt embodies a 
plural subject in which the different beings naturally integrate into each other as one, to resume Reisiger's biographical characterization of Whitman. Against this backdrop, Thomas Mann's quite dazzling conception of democracy can be better understood. In his 1944 lecture, The War and the Future, Mann emphasizes that he favors democracy not so much as a demand from below, but as goodwill, generosity, and love coming from the top down. He explains this idea in a very pictorial, even a little funny way. I do not consider it very democratic if little Mr. Smith or little Mr. Jones slaps Beethoven on the back and shouts, how are you, old man? That is not democracy, but tactlessness and a lack of feeling for differences. But when Beethoven sings, be embraced, ye millions, this kiss to all the world, that is democracy. For Thomas Mann, no one else embodied such, a, such human greatness as the American president. As a plural subject, FDR is virtually predestined to be a democratic leader. The experience of being himself a profoundly contradictory being and of having to live with these contradictions makes him capable of love in an explicitly Christian sense, understood as compassion from, from which goodwill and generosity grow towards all people. We could also speak of humility, especially since the religious dimension echoed in this word resonates again and again in Thomas Mann's democratic writings, which is, of course, an entirely idiosyncratic connection. For this reason, the aspect of equality, the very foundation of democracy, undergoes a clear devaluation as a demand from below. What is happening here can only be described as dialectical. Thomas Mann draws consequences from his American-influenced, Whitman-inspired concept of democracy that can hardly be described as democratic, at least not in the sense of the American Constitution. Agnes E. Meyer, Thomas Mann's American friend and patron, aimed exactly at this when she openly accused him of a misconception of democracy. And even today's critics aim at this aspect when they accuse Mann of having, of having an elitist and therefore contradictory concept of democracy. This objection is absolutely convincing, of course. However, it usually fails to consider the indissoluble connection between inner plural plurality and contrariness, fragility and compassion, which are at the center of Mann's conception of democracy. The same is true for the political and historical frame conditions. For Thomas Mann, the necessity of a great man at the head of a democracy results from the threat posed by Hitler and Nazi Germany. It is precisely in this situation that he needs more than just a pleasant, humble, and dignified citizen among citizens, as he described the president of Weimar Germany, Friedrich Ebert, in his speech of the German, uh, on the German Republic. In times of existential threat, democracy must become a militant democracy, as he said in 1939, a democracy freed of all self-doubt, a democracy that knows what it wants, namely victory, the victory of civilization over barbarism. For this great historical undertaking, a new Caesar is needed, and by this, Mann expressly, expressly means a wheelchair Caesar. With this, of course, I do not mean to say, as I would like to emphasize, that for Mann, the ability to be a true Democrat depends on the degree of physical fragility. But he obviously attributes a democratizing effect to biographical tensions and identity conflicts that are not repressed, but mediated mediating inner conflicts, for example, between morality and biology, illness and vitality, prevents us from elevating ourselves to a steeled, absolute ego, current examples are obvious, and instead reminds us of the plurality within the ego itself. In this sense, the title character in Thomas Mann's novel, Joseph the Provider, the fourth and most American part of the 
Tetralogy, Tetralogy from 1944, is for one thing modeled after Roosevelt in his political, political actions, especially with regard to the New Deal reforms. Beyond that, however, it is crucial to note that Joseph is also a plural subject. The double blessing that the patri patriarch Jacob gives Joseph enables him to overcome the classical dualisms of the heights above and the depths which lay beneath. That is a rare blessing, for mostly one has the choice of pleasing either God or the world. But the spirit of the charm and mediation gave it to him, Joseph, that he pleased them both. As you can see, the self-description of the ego in Whitman's Song of Myself basically also applies to Mann's Joseph. I am large. I contain multitudes. Being himself a large individual in Whitman's sense, Joseph relies completely on the potency of great men and not on parliaments or the like. Pharaoh himself, the beautiful son of the two lands, should carry out what he decides. Joseph outlines his directive view of politics and not leave the performance of it to tried and tested servants. Similarly, Thomas Mann was rather critical of American parliamentarism and the system of checks and balances. From this perspective, from his perspective, they unnecessarily drag out important decision-making processes, which for him was shown above all by the hesitant entry of the United States into the Second World War. Accordingly, Mann was not very enthusiastic about President Roosevelt as a politician in the con conventional sense. Rather, rather, he praised him as a mass tamer of the modern style, as he wrote in a letter to Agnes Meyer. Democracy on the outside is guaranteed by the demo democratic personality of its highest representatives. This is Thomas Mann's basic conviction. If one asks for a novel or a story in Thomas Mann's earliest work in which he his rather eccentric understanding of democracy is already indicated, it will, would be the novel Royal Highness from 1909. It was published earlier than all the other works I have mentioned so far. The approach to, to democracy in this very astonishing book, which is usually underestimated, even among Thomas Mann scholars, can be seen in three ways. Firstly, with the protagonist, Prinz Klaus Heinrich, Mann creates a plural subject which is able to balance the contradictions of his physical handicap and his political leadership role, actually much like President Roosevelt, in a fairy tale manner. Secondly, the novel articulates a positive perception of the United States, especially with regard to capitalism and gender roles. Um, and here, I think, a really progressive understanding of modernity is expressed. Thirdly and finally, Thomas Mann retrospectively described his, the interplay of these tendencies as a spiritual, spiritual turn to the democratic. In Royal Highness, he wrote in 1954, the crisis of individualism was at issue, which had seized my generation beautifully, the spiritual turn to the, democ to the democratic. Admittedly, in Mann's poisoned war writings around 1914, and especially in the reflections of a non-political man, all this is buried under militarism, nationalism, and anti-modernist critique. It took until 1922, when he gave his speech on the German Republic, for these ideas to reemerge, now strengthened by Whitman, from the ideo ideological darkness in a new and luminous way. Taking Thomas Mann as a model for democracy, as the New York Times journalist David Brooks, for example, suggested in 2017, requires an important distinction. In what exactly does he appear as to be exemplary? At least in one respect, his conception of democracy seems outdated, I think, namely in his disregard for parliament and the separation of powers with his attempt to tie democracy to the concept of a superior, glorious personality, 
Thomas Mann is still largely indebted to the 19th century and the phantasm of the great man. It must, however, be considered that he does not no longer associate greatness with strength and assertiveness, but with inner contradiction. Mann fundamentally reinterprets the tradi traditional concept. For him, this necessity resulted not least from the fact that Adolf Hitler had completely perverted, perverted the idea of the great man. In addition, Mann must be granted a certain distrust of democratic decision-making processes and the majority principle. After all, Hitler and the Nazis were not prevented by the democracy of the Weimar Republic, on the contrary. <clears throat> Beyond these critical considerations, Thomas Mann's democratic ideas are, I think, indeed stimulating for our time. The fact that democracy is and must be more than a form of government government, that it begins with the subject's relationship to itself and to the world, is after all hardly taken into account in the current debate, at least not in Germany. If we ignore his fixation on the great man for just a moment, we can see that Thomas Mann is approaching a concept of democracy that John Dewey had developed in his famous book on democracy and education a few decades before. For Dewey, Democracy is a mode of associated living, of co-joined, conjoint, communicated experience. For this reason, the individual must be able to process more numerous and more varied points of contact and integrate a greater diversity of stimuli into itself. This position is not far from Whitman's I contain multitudes, and therefore not far from Mann's idea of a plural subject either. But this idea can be taken one step further. What does it actually mean to unite a multiplicity of opinions, positions, and concerns, concerns within oneself? It means abandoning the belief in universal and absolute positions and instead coming to terms with the impure, mixed proportions of human existence and coexistence. From this perspective, Mann's conception of democracy, for all that justified criticism in detail, cannot be called anything other than inspiring. This is, however, hardly appreciated adequately in the discussion, especially in his empath empathetic insistence on the individual's tolerance of internal contradictions and ambiguities, he anticipates a position that was only established in Germany in the 1960s. It states that a democracy cannot exist if its inhabitants do not internalize democracy as an attitude toward themselves and the society. The point, of course, is that Thomas Mann himself demonstra demonstrates precisely this in his thinking and writing, perhaps in his life, with all its transformations and discontinuities. This finally brings me to a somewhat polemical remark on Thomas Mann's critics and their demand, demand for a flawless democratic consciousness. For where does this demand actually come from? Perhaps it is because of Thomas Mann's exposed position in the struggle for democracy. Doesn't this oblige him to conceptual consistency and theoretical solidity? No, that is not the case, and for two reasons. First, the commitment to democracy in times of war and ideological threat makes sense in itself. It seems almost cynical to me to accuse Thomas Mann, of all people, of not being truly informed and grounded in questions of democracy. Even more, it is precisely his idea of a defensible, explicitly militant democracy that seems to me absolutely re relevant for our time. Why else support a democratic state against the brutal imperialism of an autocratic neighboring country? And secondly, the criticism also seems biographically inappropriate to me. Mann was by no means born a Democrat, on the contrary. And yet, he appropriated democracy in the 1920s with astonishing openness and mental flexibility. His turning toward Whitman as an iridescent source of inspiration, would you blame him for that? I cannot shake off the impression that the criticism of Thomas Mann as a Democrat strikingly repeats what Ralph Waldo Emerson once dialectically used against Goethe 
whom he deeply admired, being so much, we cannot forgive him for not being more. Thank you very much.